Uh, today, we're going to be interviewing Dr. Gerard Torino, uh, former chair of medicine at Mount Sinai St. Luke's, Mount Sinai West. And we're going to start today because he's got an illustrious career. He's been a wonderful mentor. He remains an inspiration to staffs at every level of training. So, Dr. Torino, we're going to start with where you were born and how you got to be where you are, how you were raised, and how you got your interest in medicine, and in particular pulmonary. Oh. Well, uh, I was born in New York City as, uh, as an infant, and then uh, during my infancy, actually, my family uh, moved to a house in Brooklyn, New York, and I grew up in Brooklyn. Uh -huh. uh, I went to the public schools. Uh, I went to a junior high school called Shallow, Shallow Junior High School, and then finally Manual Training High School. Mm. Uh, and uh, there I had a great time. I got interested in track, won my major letter <laughs> in, on the track team, uh, and we won the uh, New York City Championship in track the year I was there. Uh, oh, wow. work, uh, so it was just an an exciting time. Uh, I applied to Princeton University and they accepted me. And so I went from manual training to Princeton and that was in 1941. Wow. And uh, during 1941, World War II started. I was at Princeton. I had already indicated my intent to go on and be pre-med, planning to go to medical school. and. Uh, they had a program for the pre-med students. They thought that this was going to be a long war and they would need physicians. So they were allowing people who had in intended to go to medical school to continue on. So I stayed in the Navy. We had a Navy program called the V-12 for uh, people who were continuing their education. But in the Navy, uh, we had exercises we performed at Princeton <laughs> and we had runs and things like that and we had actually parades uh, so that was an interesting time and uh, at the end of that well at the end uh, it was in 1944 uh, that I went to Columbia Medical School in New York still in the Navy uh, we were, I think, called ensigns at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, P&S was great. It was a wonderful place to be. And uh, began medical school and uh, continued on. But in 1945, the war ended. And we were discharged from the Navy and continued on in our education. Uh, P&S was a, a very exciting place at that time. Uh, medical science uh, advanced rather precipitously during World War II in many areas. Uh, the NIH was being formed, so it was an exciting time to be in medicine. And uh, I, uh, I went into medicine in part because I had an uncle uh, who was Thomas Torino. He was a graduate of P&S in 1928. Wow. That was the year that the Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center was uh, inaugurated, 1928. Uh, he unfortunately was killed in World War II. He was in OBGYN, he was a surgeon, and uh, his hospital ship was torpedoed in the Pacific in Rendova. He won, this, he won a, uh, the Silver Star, so he was an inspiration for me. I knew him quite well. So, I had these stimuli to go into medicine as a family matter. Um, after graduating from PNS, I uh, had an internship on the Columbia Division at Bellevue. And I have to say that was a transforming experience. Um, that was an exciting time at Bellevue. We're in the 40s now. Uh, cardiac catheterization had already been done. Uh, there were elaborate studies going on in Dr. Cournon and Dr. Rich's laboratory at Bellevue. Uh, these were landmark studies. And 
lung function was being defined physiologically in great detail. So being there, you could be part of it. Mm. I specifically recall that research meetings took place on a Saturday morning from 9 until 12, with, and, the, and the room was packed with people. So it was that, that kind of excitement at the time. So it was a, a wonderful place. Uh, I got introduced to Dr. Kuhnan and Dr. Richards. Uh, I stayed a second year at Bellevue and uh, then went off to Yale because my thought was I needed more training in metabolism. And uh, John Peters was the director of medicine of Peters and Van Slyke. This was a, a landmark bit of work that Peters and Van Slyke did on body water and electrolytes. This was uh, really landmark studies. So um, I went up to New Haven and had, I was there then uh, in my third year of residency and had a wonderful time. But while I was there, the Korean War broke out. Mm. And so all of those, all of us who were trained uh, during World War II immediately had to go into the service. We were drafted. Mm. I selected the Air Force to go into, and uh, I had my orders to go to Korea. The embarkation port was San Francisco, and uh, I was preparing to go when uh, one of the faculty members at New, New, in New Haven, uh, was, his name was Douglas Lawrence, and he was a hematologist and kind of a friend. And he asked what I was doing, and I said, well, I'm preparing to go to Korea, I had my, my orders. He said, uh, you know, we're going down to Washington to work on a crash program, and uh, we'd like you to come with us if you can. And I said, but I have orders. Uh, they said, we'll get your orders changed. And they did. Mm -hmm. And in 24 hours, I was on my way to Washington, D.C., working at the National Research Council, which was in the Academy, National Academy of Sciences, instead of going to Korea. Oh, well, lucky. it was a luck. Luck really counts for a lot in one's life. <laughs> uh, we were working on trying to create a uh, substitute for plasma. They had problems in sterilizing the plasma because it was prone to getting hepatitis virus, right. uh, which was made from it was made from human blood. Right. Uh, and they wanted either to find a way of sterilizing the plasma, or create a substitute for plasma. Right. So we initiated a, a program trying to uh, develop uh, synthetic substances which could serve as plasma volume expanders. That is when you have a casualty and there's blood loss, you have an agent that can fulfill the blood loss. And we did in three years develop a substance called Dextran, which still exists today. Uh, and uh, that was a very interesting experience. Um, we. Uh, we had really a very interesting time medically with, with the clinical trials we had to carry out. Uh, we had volunteers from the services, and we had to fashion the dextran according to a certain molecular weight and branching ratio of the molecule so it was not antigenic, and that took a lot of time. So while there, uh, Dickinson Richards was on some advisory committees of the National Research Council and he knew I, I was uh, coming out of the service. And he said that I want to be chief resident on the first division at Bellevue. And that was ideal because I hadn't done any clinical work for three years except in this study. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I said I would. And I went back to Bellevue as the chief resident. And uh, that was an interesting year. And it was, uh, uh, that was a great division medically. and. Uh, being chief resident was quite a responsibility, but uh, I really enjoyed it. And again, it brought me then closer to uh, the group at Bellevue who were working in cardiopulmonary disease, mm -hmm. still doing research. When uh, I finished that year, uh, I was, uh, Dr. Riches asked if I would like a fellowship. And uh, at that time, there was a laboratory 
a pulmonary lab, a cardiopulmonary. In those days, it was cardiopulmonary laboratories. And we were catheterizing hearts, actually, mm -hmm. in the cardiopulmonary laboratory at the same time doing pulmonary function tests and studying lung function. So uh, there was a laboratory at Presbyterian and a laboratory down at Bellevue, and Dr. Richards made it possible to go up to Presbyterian. Um, the director of the lab, who was John West by name, uh, unfortunately got leukemia and died before my arrival. Oh. So there was no director, but there were other fellows, and uh, I had a, a first year up there. Uh, in the second year, um, uh, La Alfred Fishman was appointed director of the laboratory, and uh, I was his first fellow. And uh, we embarked on a whole bunch of studies over the next several years, uh, at least uh, 10 years there working. And um, I had wonderful associates. Edward Bogofsky was a fellow along with me who uh, went on to be quite a significant figure in pulmonary medicine. Harry um, Fritz? Harry Fritz was there and he was down at Bellevue. Mm -hmm. But we had a, a close cooperation between Presbyterian and, and the Bellevue Laboratory. But while there, uh, while there, I was uh, started out as a fellow, uh, fellow of the New York. I had a six-year fellow of the New York Heart Association, which was a very nice fellowship. And and then I became an investigator of the City of New York. The City of New York had research fellowships uh, available, and I was able to have that for support for ten years. But during those years, uh, I realized that. We were being proficient in quantifying lung function and now cardiovascular function, but we really didn't know what was causing the diseases. And I didn't think we were going to bring insight into disease mechanisms at a tissue level, at a basic level, physiologically. So I decided to embark on some studies on the lung tissue structure. Um, I was able to uh, work with Carl Meyer, who was there, who was a biochemist, a glycosaminoglycan biochemist, uh, who actually discovered hyaluronan. Mm -hmm. And so I spent uh, a year working with him. And uh, that was a, an insight for me into a whole new area of uh, medi medicine medical science. Um, so that's how you sort of got into the chronic obstructive lung disease model. That's right. Yeah. And so um, while there, um, I also collaborated and um, was fortunate to get to know Inez Mandel, who was also a biochemist at PNS. Uh, she was in the department of OBGYN, but her special interests was the elastic tissue of the, of the body. Mm -hmm. She had her early beginnings in uh, Vienna, actually, and had come here in the United States at the end of the war. And uh, we began to talk about the possibilities of the kind of studies we might be able to do. And we came up with the idea of a program project from the National Institutes of Health. Um, which uh, had the uh, approach of uh, investigating mechanisms of lung injury. Uh, we got the program project. Uh, Inez Mandel was a very important part of that. Uh, Carl Meyer was also a consultant. And uh, we began studies in uh, models of uh, emphysema, which we could produce with enzymes. In 1963, a disease was discovered in Sweden, was, which was called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And uh, that is a genetic disease where there is a low concentration 
of a protein in the blood that has a specific function. And that function is to inhibit an enzyme in the body, a normal enzyme in the body, which is in our white blood cells. And it's an elastase. It's an enzyme that actually breaks down elastic tissue. And people who have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency develop emphysema at a young age, even if they don't smoke, because the lung elastic tissue is being degraded by this uninhibited enzyme. Um, well, that was a, an important insight, because for the first time, we had a potential etiology or an etiological mechanisms which could cause lung damage leading to pathologically which was emphysema. So it was a pathway to look at models of emphysema uh, in animals. If you inject an elastase into a, uh, a hamster or a dog or, or, an, an, or a, I mean a mouse, you can produce pulmonary emphysema. So uh, one of my close associates, Jerome Cantor, who is an experimental pathologist, uh, embarked on a number of studies of these models of emphysema in animals. And out of that came two important directions for our work. Um, we realized that uh, elastin was the um, target and vulnerable target of the lung uh, because elastic tissue lines alveoli. It's present in bronchi. It's present in the circulation also. But when you degrade it in the lung, particularly in the alveoli, you get emphysema. So um, we began to, well, one, one, one direction, and I'll, um, involved the uh, development of a, an agent which might prevent uh, destruction of the lung. Mm. Dr. Cantor and, and I were uh, doing these studies and we were studying enzymes which could make the emphysema worse in the animal. And uh, we tried a number of enzymes like trypsin, even tried high oxygen, but we finally picked on an enzyme called hyaluronidase. Now, hyaluronidase is a very specific enzyme that degrades hyaluronic acid. And when we did that and then gave an elastase to the animal, the emphysema was much worse. Mm. So we reasoned that this was an enzyme that was degrading this glycosamine or glycan hyaluronon. So maybe if we gave the hyaluronon before we gave the elastase, it might prevent mm -hmm. the severity of the emphysema. And that's what happened. So, so that we was then. An incredible insight. Uh, yeah, it was luck, as it were. We just came on this and followed it up. So, uh, what followed then were a number of studies to determine what giving hyaluronic acid to animals might do. So, uh, we could show that. It, uh, giving hyaluronic acid uh, prevented severity of the emphysema in the animals that we were injecting the elastases in. That was one thing. We then uh, created a, uh, a, a matrix of elastin, which you can do. Endothelial cells will grow elastic tissue. We labeled the elastic tissue with C14 so that if you degraded the elastic tissue, the C14 would leak out and would give you a, a numerical index of severity. And there too, hyaluronon protected that matrix against breakdown. We then went on to uh, exposing mice to tobacco smoke. And we would carry the exposure into months, as long as eight and nine months. And uh, there too, the hyaluronon animals as opposed to the animals didn't get hyaluronon, were protected against the severity of the emphysema. Um, so uh, all of this has led up to further development of hyaluronon as a potential therapy. We did have 
one small study. Oh, and I'm, let me go back because at this time we were, we were also developing our biomarker. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we knew uh, chemically that elastic tissue has two amino acids in it, in the mature elastic tissue fiber. Uh, there are two amino acids. One is called desmosine, the other one is isodesmosine. They are what are called crosslinks. When you are going to synthesize elastin in the body, it starts out in a soluble form. I'm getting too technical, perhaps. Uh, tropo, tropoelastin is the, uh, the soluble form. When these two amino acids, which are called crosslinks, get on the tropoelastin, it becomes insoluble and becomes a fiber. So the important thing about desmosine and isodesmosine is they only occur in elastic tissue. So if you can measure them in the body's fluids, you can detect how much elastin is being degraded in the body. This was known for some time, and the methods which were developed to detect desmosine and isodesmosine were uh, based upon radioimmunoassays or ELISAs, which depended upon antibodies to the desmosine and isodesmosine. Unfortunately, the antibodies, depending upon which laboratory developed the antibody, varied because the specificity of the antibody was not that great. So there were variable results uh, which made, as in the various laboratory, which reduced the credence of the biomarker. Mm. Um, I knew that, and uh, I thought, gee, if only we had a, uh, a method that we knew was reliable and sensitive that could measure small concentrations. Well, uh, by this time, I was no longer director of medicine. I left, I guess I was finished about 1992, mm -hmm. but I stayed on. We had research going on. Uh, I was able to develop a lung center down at uh, St. Luke's Roosevelt called the James P. Mara Center, uh, which was supported by funds from the Carson Family Foundation. Uh, I was fortunate in their support of me, and uh, they gave me $2 million. And uh, that $2 million uh, paid for a renovation of the space at Roosevelt for the Mara Center. I should say that uh, it was called the James P. Mara Center because she was the he was the brother of Mrs. Carson, and he had alpha one antitrypsin deficiency, and she wanted to commemorate his memory, and so that's why we named it the James P. Mara Center. We had two million dollars to start with. We did renovate the space for about three hundred thousand, and then I had some funds for research going on. Um, is that what's continuing your support to your current work? Uh, it has, yes. It continues my support to the present time uh, into the next near, near future, how far into the distance we are. So it, it's very exciting that you've done the, this research has been pyramidal, pyramidal in terms of building and building and building yes. uh, on and with, with luck and a lot of hard work. It's a yeah. lot of hard work too. Yeah. Yeah. Patience. And, and evolving uh, and so on. But in the middle of all this, you took on a huge administrative role uh, at becoming the first James Keating Professor of Medicine here at St. Luke's. Yes. How did you make that decision that you would do that? Because it would obviously curtail some of the time you had to do the research that was very exciting. Well, I was, I was fortunate in that I, I had my group from the program project at mm -hmm. Columbia Presbyterian and I brought them down to St. Luke's Roosevelt when I assumed the chairmanship of the department. So they were functioning while I was chairman of medicine. They were carrying the major load. I had the responsibility of the department, which was a lot of responsibility. I knew that. That, that was in 1983? In 83, yeah. when I came as chairman of medicine and then brought my group down through the 80s and 90s. Uh, we had the program project for 15 years. So we were able to carry on the work. Uh, we got renewals. And uh, so uh, I guess I just had to 
depend upon the people I was working with to carry on and keep me informed. Mm -hmm. And that's how we, we went forward, actually. So how did you then um, develop the department? And how, how did you look at avenues you could strengthen, facilitate research, et cetera? Uh, and the training, the, obviously the training program. Yes, oh yes, I, I was very much aware that well, my vision was that St. Louis Roosevelt could be the Peter Bent Brigham of New York. And what was being recognized in those years was uh, medical discovery. And if, if you showed that you were on the, on the top tier of medical science, that was important in an institution in creating confidence in the institution. So I did try to recruit people who could add to the research in the institution. I was fortunate being able to uh, recruit Jahar Bhattacharya, who stayed with us for 18 years. He is now a leading investigator in pulmonary medicine. Uh, he was uh, uh, recruited by Columbia Presbyterian away from us, but he's still there. Still, you uh, Alan Rosansky. Uh, I felt cardiology had to be built. He was a, an outstanding figure in visualization uh, of the cardiovascular system, mm -hmm. and uh, I was able to recruit him away from the West Coast, where he, which is where he was. So we did, uh, and uh, we brought on. Uh, you know, in the eighties, uh, there was the uh, a, a, the AIDS epidemic, yes. and. Uh, we brought on David Volsky, mm -hmm. who was an outstanding investigator in AIDS and HIV. Uh, he's got a model of HIV in animals. He's still here. Mm -hmm. So uh, those were some of my recruits I can be proud of. And I think it, it added and still is adding to the institution, this institution and others. Um, but uh, I will go back to just to, to the show where we went with the biomarker, if I may, because it's important in the sort of the where we are. So um, as I indicated, the, uh, we did have these two amino acids, which were indicators uh, of elastin degradation. And you must realize that when alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency was discovered and the disease was caused by a deficiency of an inhibitor of an elastase, that brought focus on elastic tissue in the lung. The significance of elastic tissue in maintaining its structure to maintain the lung matrix. So uh, that was a good insight going forward. And uh, we thought if we could develop this biomarker a little more reliably, it would be an important biomarker for studies going forward in the, less, in the emphysema. Um, we, um, so the way it came, uh, came about, uh, I had the f support from the James P. Mara Fund, and uh, uh, I had an associate here, uh, Seymour Lieberman, who headed the Health Science Institute of, of uh, St. Luke's Roosevelt. Uh, Seymour was a wonderful uh, biochemist. He was a, a wonderful director uh, and um, had his own work in measuring female hormone, uh, female hormone uh, uh, effects physiologically, uh, their levels and all that. And he was using mass spectrometry as a measuring device for his hormones. And uh, I realized that, uh, gosh, these are in low concentration. I wonder if the mass spectrometers could be used to measure desmosine and isodesmosine. So uh, I asked Seymour, could I work with some of his biochemists? And he said, sure, go ahead. So uh, I approached Young Wai Lin who was working with Seymour, who was a, an expert in mass spectrometry and liquid chromatography. And I said, do you think you could measure these two amino acids? They're not hormones, they are peptides. And he said, sure. And <laughs> in a matter of weeks, uh, using his mass spectrometer, 
that he was able to develop a method. But I needed the mass spectrometers for our studies. So I went to Russell Carson and I said, I need $300,000 for new mass spectrometers, the most up-to-date they have. He said, I'll give you a check tomorrow. So I had the money immediately. We bought the mass spectrometers and developed the method, which is still in existence and is the most accurate and sensitive method, which has given credence to desmosine and isodesmosine uh, as biomarkers in COPD. Well, I can see how success in doing this kind of work and persistence in following it through led to the next step, which created the confidence for funding. That's really yes. critical for it to go forth. Do you think that this kind of process, uh, this kind of career that you had, how it impacted on all our trainees? Some of them obviously were interested in the research track, others were not. But I think it has a, a lasting impact on what I call the level of academic proficiency and quality that we also teach. So I wondered how you saw that as a carryover to your other big hat role of being chief of medicine. Yes, well, uh, we, uh, you'd always hope that people would, in training in medicine, would, would go into research. But it doesn't always work that way. And uh, we didn't have as many individuals I would have liked to get into our program. In, and it may have been kind of uh, rather isolated in terms of the methodology, mass spectrometry being in, and liquid chromatography. But, uh, but uh, I think that possibility still exists. Uh, we are going forward with our studies, and I'm very much uh, hoping that I can interest some of our fellows to continue on the work in our laboratory going forward. It's most important. Right, and at, at the time you were there too, there were two separate training programs, St. Luke's and Roosevelt. How did you see that merge and then later on with continuum? Um, well, it, we did, it, it was a, a, um, a likely outcome that instead of having two separate house staff training programs, they could be, uh, could be combined uh, administrator that would have been important and also most important was the training was strengthened by having each of these hospitals with their own environments. Mm -hmm. They serve different parts of the city, uh, they vary in, in the severity of disease in them uh, and this was I think a useful exposure. So I think that was a successful outcome combining the two training programs. I remember during the AIDS epidemic there were many people who didn't want to train in New York because they quote we'd only see AIDS <laughs> and, I, and I, I remember being very um, upset about that because in fact it was like if you learn AIDS you learn medicine because yeah. it impacted on every system organ system in the patients. Yes. So I was wondering th did you see that as an impact at all uh, in your the quality of training, things of that type. We had superb people. Oh here. yes, these the AIDS patients in those years, in the 80s and early 90s, were very sick. Most of them ended up in the intensive care unit. Almost all of them had to have a bronchoscopy because pulmonary complications were so common. So it was an intense time for the fellows to uh, care for these patients mm -hmm. and to car carry out these bronchoscopies so in a way it intensified the, uh, the quality of the training they had. So uh, it, was an, it was an interesting time. Uh, How did you marry all this work with your lovely wife who's also a physician? Did you meet her at PNS? Well, uh, to go back to New Haven. Oh. <laughs> uh, I knew uh, Dorothy was two years behind me in medical school. Uh, I was class in 1948, she was in that class in 1950. Uh, I met her briefly in her fourth year of the medical school. She was a, a student at Bellevue, taking the Bellevue rotation. rotation. And I saw her on the wards at Bellevue looking for a patient. She had to make a presentation to the professor. So uh, I pointed out where the patient was and told her all about the patient. And uh, that we got at least introduced to each other at that time. 
But then I went up to New Haven mm -hmm. that next year, and she was there as an intern. Oh. So <laughs> I was her senior resident, actually, through a good part of that year. Uh, when I uh, got drafted into the service in the Korean War, uh, we were seeing each other rather uh, regularly, and uh, we became engaged. Mm. And when I had the opportunity to go to Washington, instead, instead of going to Korea, we got married. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> and uh, and we've, we've had three sons. We have a wonderful family. And uh, Dorothy went on with her training in uh, rheumatology and became really an, an outstanding rheumatologist at Columbia Presbyterian. She was also an associate dean for alumni affairs. Uh, she ran the Committee on Affirmative Action. You know, there was a committee formed so that there would be a, 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 how shall I say, fair processes in recruiting. And she carried that on for years. A very difficult task, believe me, because most chairmen of departments didn't want to know about affirmative action at that time. Mm -hmm. So she had a wonderful career uh, until uh, four years ago, when uh, she uh, had became somewhat uh, a victim of age, <laughs> I would say. Uh, but we had a wonderful marriage, and uh, we have a wonderful family, as you asked about Well, her. I remember her fondly because she was also one of my preceptors. <laughs> and so she was my teacher, and yes. you were my teacher, so I was like, all the family, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, she, she was a great, a very, she loved teaching, and uh, she loved taking care of patients. And, and, and in rheumatology, you really have to take care of your patients. Exactly. I mean, it's exactly. the doctor-patient relationship with the rheumatology drugs uh, depends so much on trial and error. Oh, and boy. she was very good at it and patient, yeah. And she was also always had such a very warm, cheerful demeanor so yeah. that the patients felt a lot of confidence and trust. And I think that's very much a part of my training to see that kind of role model yeah. is the interactions with the physician and the patient and the amount of respect that was accorded that created that wonderful doctor-patient relationship. Yeah. She was a wonderful model, model figure. She was a wonderful, right? wonderful physician and a wonderful wife. Right. Yeah. Did yeah. We had a good marriage. But did, did your sons pursue a medical career after all no, this? No, I had three sons and here they had mother and father in medicine. And I think they wanted to seek, seek their own, <laughs> own challenges. And uh, uh, they're all different. They all do different things, all the way from real estate to architecture to, uh, to upstart development in, uh, financially. They all have different careers. And they're, they're, we're still close and, and uh, see each other. You know, we're a close family. I'm a grandpa four times. Oh, my. <laughs> yeah. that, that's called life's bounty in, yeah. in, in yeah. my mind. Well, you, you've seen the changes over a period of time, over 30 years now. What do you think about the directions we're going? We're seeming to be bigger, and uh, w what do you see our, our future? You mean in medicine? Yeah, and with St. Luke's, Roosevelt, uh, et cetera, within the Mount Sinai family. Yeah. Well, well, the change I, I've seen is um, is a more prescribed control uh, of what uh, the commitment is to people in training in medicine, the residencies. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that came from indicating that there were time slots where people would serve and then they would be free. Um, there's much more administrative control of the training program, it seems to me. Uh, that's pun partially, I suppose, financial concerns. But I think uh, what the, uh, I call it the, uh, the shift mentality, has produced is a focus on the job to be done and not much more. Mm. And when we were in training, we were in certain training areas, of course, we were expected to extend ourselves beyond the clinical realm, become interested in something that we could grow on. And that is important in training because yeah. you, you spend your life 
And if you can focus on something early on, you grow with it as you go forward. And that is an important part of medicine. And young people are not doing that these days. They are fulfilling their obligations, clinical obligations, and they don't seem to feel the need or the desire or the stimulus to explore beyond. Well, into quote, there's no time, right? Yes, there's no time, but uh, there was no time for us either, but we did it. And, uh, and what that also uh, probably depends upon is collaboration. Yes. So you've got to create an environment where the opportunity for collaboration between people in science at, at the basic level or even the clinical level and people in training, that collaboration can happen. And exactly. that was the, the environment we had during my training up at Columbia Presbyterian, even New Haven, that was there. It was easy, everybody was accessible. Right. Institutions maybe structurally have gotten big, bigger. and they've been bigger, bigger, and they've uh, uh, been architecturally uh, depending upon financial and, and uh, real estate concerns instead of how do you bring people together, which is still important. Critical. Well, you were a president of the American Thoracic Society, too. So yes. that's an international society of like-minded people interested in uh, thoracic disorders. So I wondered, from that experience, you were connecting around the world now uh, as a leader and also uh, within the administrative uh, components of uh, the ATS, of how you saw how that would either facilitate or did it hinder what you were trying to do? Well, uh, the American Thoracic Society had, a, had a, a very significant history in pulmonary medicine. And uh, being involved with them was, was an, an opportunity uh, to advance uh, research in lung disease. Uh, the American Thoracic uh, at that time was affiliated with the American Lung Association. And we were raising about $10 million a year for research. Um, but um, we, wanted, we needed much more. Lung diseases were a very important part of the pathology of, of disease in the, in, in the world, really. Uh, I mean, right today, for example, COPD uh, is the third, uh, in, the third co increased cause of death in, uh, in the world. We estimate that about 300 million people have COPD. We in the United States, we have about 25 million, and we don't have a, a treatment for that. Right, we, we treat have, symptoms. We treat symptoms. Right. So uh, I was uh, aware of this, and uh, while I was uh, president of the uh, of the ATS, I was affiliated with the American Lung, and uh, I thought we should f decide how would they spend their money. And, uh, and that was money from the stamps, right? That was yeah, Christmas stamps. Christmas yeah. stamps, yeah, and and donations. Um, but I assembled a group of people when I was president. Well, I guess maybe before I was president, then I became president. To, for a whole year, we considered what disease should the American Lung Association devote itself to at that time. Uh, and uh, at the end of the year, everybody came up with, with asthma. Asthma was being a recognized as a, a disease affecting a lot of people. Yeah, it, had a more, it had a mortality, it had a mortality, uh, often an unexpected mortalities. And we really knew very little about how to treat it. And, uh, I convinced the American Thoracic Society, the American Lung Association, to raise $25 million, which we did over the years, to cause, to uh, develop centers of research in asthma. And that became their asthma program with 19 centers around the country, which still exist. So uh, that shows what, what can be done if you really push it. Um, I feel the same way now about COPD. It's not getting the attention it, des it deserves. And uh, I've made this known in some of the committees I'm on at the ATS. 
But if I can, I go back. I want to finish the yes. story oh, yes, about the the biomarker because it's it's quite interesting. When uh, I was able to, uh, with the help of Young Wai Lin, and now his his associate Shurin Ma, uh, develop mass spectrometry and liquid chromatography as a method to measure the uh, desmosine and isodesmosine. As it turns out, we could measure it in plasma, urine, and sputum. And that was important because the biomarker was always criticized because you didn't know where the biomarker was coming from. But with sputum, it's only coming from the lung. And with bronchoalveal lavage fluid, it's only coming from the lung. So with that method, uh, which has gotten, I think, accepted, um, we have been able to publish the results with the biomarker in ordinary COPD where it's elevated. It's even higher in alpha-1 antitrypsin COPD. Uh, we've shown it is lowered by teotropium, which is used in COPD as a bronchodilator and has some anti-inflammatory effects, which is how it lowers the biomarker. We were the first to show that augmentation therapy which is the therapy for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, where they are replacing the missing protein on weekly infusions. Everybody gets a weekly infusion for life, really. Mm -hmm. It had never been shown that it actually, that treatment reduced elastin degradation, which is what it was supposed to do, because it was supposed to block the elastase. Uh, previous attempts using the biomarker were not successful, but we did, and we've published two papers now uh, one in the short-term uh, exposure to the augmentation therapy. And the latest study, which is a four-year study with augmentation therapy using computed tomography, which CT, computed tomography, is an X-ray technique that actually can measure tissue density of the lung. And they could show that over four years, those patients who got augmentation preserved their lung density, that is, prevented the severity of emphysema. We did the biomarker, and the biomarker went down from in three months on with the augmentation therapy. So this latest study is showing a link between a visual evidence of a therapy and a chemical evidence. But what that's telling us is that if we have an agent other than augmentation therapy, that could preserve elastic tissue, we might preserve the lung. And what that tells us, if we had a therapy that could be given at the very outset of the disease of emphysema, when first detected, we might prevent this progression. And we're working on that. And that's where this hyaluronic, hyaluronon, the hyaluronic acid study comes in. Right. And uh, we are embarking at the present time on a, a clinical trial with the hyaluronan. It's in alpha-1 angiotrypsin patients. Uh, we're studying 40 patients. 20 will get uh, the hyaluronan, and 20 will get placebo. Uh, these are alpha-1 patients, not on augmentation, and we're gonna use the biomarker as an endpoint. The study will go 28 days, and we'll see what the outcome is. We'll hope the outcome is positive. If it's positive, hopefully that'll lead to further financial investment in to develop this as a therapy. I'm happy to say that the Alpha One Foundation is supporting us for this trial uh, with $500,000. So that's fortunate, and uh, we have the money to hopefully complete the trial. So we'll see what happens. Well, that's the oil for the machine for it to work. That's, that's, that's really exciting, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. very, very exciting. So if, if this works, it is a potential therapy. And the interesting thing about hyaluronan, other than augmentation therapy, augmentation therapy blocks that single enzyme. The way hyaluronan works as a barrier against elastase degradation, hyaluronan is actually embedded in elastic tissue structurally, normally. And an important fact, which we discovered in one case, uh, hyaluronan is deficient mm. in the lungs of people with COPD and alpha-1 COPD. It's half normal. 
So well, it's that missing. May explain why not everybody gets the disease yeah. who has the same t toxin to their system. Yes, right. So that would make sense. But and how, so why in a way, we're, re we're replacing something that has this function that is deficient, which uh, gives another, I guess, reason for it maybe to be used. Yeah. Or, or to be ho hopeful that this will yeah. come forth. Yeah. Did you see a functional as well as a structural and a biochemical a change in the patients? Um, we have the, the uh, trial, well, let me say, we did one small trial. Um, we had recruiting problems a few years ago. We did, however, recruit 11 patients for a study with hyurina. Mm -hmm. Three of them got placebo, eight got hyurinon, but it was only a two week exposure. Oh, yeah, sure. We didn't expect any results, it's too short a time to see any functional result. Right. And I didn't think we would see any effect on the biomarker, but we were surprised uh, that the biomarker went down in plasma, urine, and sputum mm -hmm. in two weeks. So that was encouraging, which is why we went on to this larger study that I've just described. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that offers a possibility for therapy. Uh, let's hope, what, see what comes out and uh, hopefully the FDA will allow us to go forward with a larger, even a larger study. And the ultimate target is COPD. This drug should have a role in COPD because elastin degradation is uh, the mechanism in ordinary COPD as well as probably other mechanisms. But it probably is playing a role in the development. So that's kind of, uh, where we are at the at the moment. Well, it suggests that the work will go on forever. <laughs> well, it's going to go on. I think it has to go on. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, there'll be succession from, from me to carry it on. Uh, the Alpha One Foundation seems interested in it. Uh, I've engaged some of my associates to be prepared to carry the work forward if okay. I can't. Are they here? Uh, then, well, one is here, definitely. Jerome Cantor, who's been working with me for almost over 20 years. Uh, yes, he's an associate. Uh, we have formed a corporation, actually, called Matrix Therapeutics, which uh, was created because we had to license the intellectual property for the uh, biomarker and for the therapy from Columbia and Mount Sinai. And we have licensed that from the institutions, Mount Sinai and St. Luke's. And uh, that is now, uh, the license is, is maintained by Matrix. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully that's where funding will come in for further development. And that's where the Alpha One funding will be put with Matrix. So we have a structure to go forward, if I can put it that yeah. way. So yeah. it won't die because of technical reasons. It won't. No, that, that's important. That's, that's important. important. So what do you do for fun? <laughs> <laughs> well, I used to play a lot of tennis. I loved tennis, and I would, I would play as much as I could. And in fact, we had a group at, when I was at Columbia, uh, and even when I was at St. Luke's, uh, I would play with Dick Pearson who was an avid tennis player. Mm -hmm. We would play in the uh, Columbia uh, courts up in Baker Field. And uh, we had a, a whole group that played uh, once a week up there. And, but then I haven't played tennis in the last couple of years. My legs are not as steady as they were. But, um, but I go to the theater and I travel, I travel and work and apart from work. And uh, I have good friends. And I have a summer house in East Hampton, which I do like. And I've had that for 45 years. So I still maintain that house. Your escape. My escape. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, I, I, in spite of the loss of my wife, which I do miss, uh, I do have friends. Mm -hmm. And I try to keep up with uh, the world. <laughs> well, judging from what you've said, and uh, having met uh, James Keating's grandson, uh, and knowing what his vision was. His vision was to develop a department of medicine that would have a research focus and a research life. 
uh, and uh, the developing divisions so that each subspecialty would develop expertise and excellence. And with Dr. Van Italy carrying it forward, I think you've certainly picked up the banner and carried it forward even further. Well, I would hope so, yes. I, I was inspired when I came in what Ted Van Italy had built. I mean, their uh, nutrition or obesity center was really a remarkable accomplishment yes. at, a, at a time when there was nothing like that. Right. We had it here at St. Luke's Roosevelt. Right. And the research that was going on was at a basic level, a clinical level. It was a remarkable accomplishment. So that was an inspiration, actually, yeah. right. to, go, to continue that tradition in this institution of doing research along with clinical excellence. And we felt the two were really important uh, together. <laughs> <laughs> vital to the excellence that has been now part of the history. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I know that Dr. Antonucci was the chief of medicine at Roosevelt, uh, and he was also recipient of funding that developed the Antonucci Research Building, yes, yes. which was very helpful to support the research effort that would go forth. Yes, it was after he, he was acutely aware that the strength of a, of a hospital uh, had to be not only clinical, but it had to be uh, conceptual uh, from a basic level. And that's why he built the Antonucci building. And that was how institutions could grow. And uh, I think it was a wonderful building. I mean, the research space there was excellent. Mm -hmm. And uh, it led to some very interesting work that went on. Yeah. At more than one department. More than one department, yeah. yeah. That, that it, was, it was for the whole institution. Right. Yeah. Well, they had what was called a medical science institute. That was the purpose. And that's how Seymour Lieberman was brought down right. from Columbia Presbyterian to head the institute. And uh, he enjoyed that role. That was important at that time in our development and growth, no question about it. Right. You have to have the support yeah. at that level yeah. in order to get the work done. Yes. No question. You have the space, you need to have the money, you need to have technology, yeah. and you have to have vision. All those things are part of what make it happen. And, I, uh, you, you know, your yeah. career has been outstanding, and uh, people have recognized that more recently with another award <laughs> from your alma mater. Yes. Uh, just yeah. awarded, what, two weeks ago, a week ago? A week, a week, well, about two weeks ago about now. About two weeks ago. So yeah. we got the Outstanding Clinician <laughs> Award, which is very exciting because I'm just rubbing a little off on, on you. <laughs> but it is, it is an exciting history. Uh, and one of the reasons I wanted to capture this, because we have such a rich incredible people here uh, at our institution and so this oral history project gets started with the idea that we have such an opportunity to capture the spirit the enthusiasm the intensity yeah. and the l passion really for this kind of work and uh, I'd like to see this carried on even if it's by rubbing shoulders and not direct but I think we need to continue to encourage this very very much Oh, I couldn't agree with I couldn't agree with you more. Medicine is exciting, and I'll tell you, discovery is exciting. And if you get interested in something just from the earliest thread, but pursue it, it can mean so much in your professional life. Right. You and grow. You grow. You grow with the thing you're trying to understand, <laughs> and and you're often help. I told you, it was, your luck luck takes a hand very often, more often than not. And if you're As fortunate. They say, luck favors prepared <laughs> mind, right? Yeah, that's right. So it goes together. It yeah, goes together. Yeah, no question yeah. about it. You have to see that there's luck there to, ha to have it happen. Yeah. Otherwise, it's a <laughs> stop. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add? Because it's been wonderful hearing your story. No, I guess what I would add, how, from my own personal standpoint, uh, who you're able to work with. I mean, your associates mean so much. I mean, I, in my own case, there's no question that my exposure to the environment at Bellevue, knowing Dickinson Richards, uh, Andre Cunan, people who came to that laboratory, uh, that was an extraordinary environment. And being able to reach out to people I worked with, like Inez Mandel, 
uh, Karl Meyer. Uh, those were opportunities which were unusually uh, productive in the end. Productive in the end. Right. They were open to They were that. open to that. that, that yeah. That, that and, climate. And having, yes, that climate was just, it was exciting. And uh, we have to create those climates. And that's, and medicine is exciting if you can, you know, make it possible for people to, uh, to expend their, their curiosities into medical science. Yeah. Well, I, I had, Charlie Reagan asked me to do a project and this was in the, what, late 60s, I guess. Mm -hmm. And he asked me to figure out, try to create a directory of all the people who had trained in the cardiopulmonary lab and where they went. Yeah. Okay. So in the late 60s, 75% of people who were heads of pulmonary across the United States had trained with Dickinson Richards and Andre yeah. Cormat, 75%. Yeah. Yes, that's true. And Tom Petty was one of them. Yeah. Uh, he could yeah. talk endlessly about yeah. the experience uh, that he had here. So it was just, just Well, that was a major laboratory, a no, no major question. Laboratory. Yeah, they, they, Tremendous yeah. work was done. Yeah. And, and incredible. And you're right. Uh, nobody ever missed those conferences. And there was <laughs> not an hour just seemed like ridiculous. It, people would spend half the day. Yeah. But nowadays we don't work on Saturdays. They don't have classes yeah. on Saturdays <laughs> anymore either, so yeah. it, it's, it's a change. Uh, I don't know if it's good or bad, but you know whatever it is, it's a change in w how we live with it. Well, thank you so much. I, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed it. Well, thank and, you so uh, much. You were very kind to ask me <laughs> to, to do this. And I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to do still it. Still optimistic about the future, and we'll see how we do. I'm Gerard Torino. Uh, I am a professor of medicine at the Mount Sinai uh, Icon School of Medicine. I am founding director of the James P. Mara Center for Lung Disease at uh, uh, Mount Sinai West and Mount Sinai St. Luke's.